Greetings. Here to discuss consolidation settlement. And I'd like to begin with a simple definition, and that relates to squeezing water out of voids of a saturated, from the voids of saturated fine grained soils. And this definition includes two assumptions that are quite important for our use of consolidation theory. And that is that the soil is saturated and that it is indeed fine grained. And arguments can certainly be made that this process is occurring in unsaturated soil as well as in soils other than fine grained. But by all means, this is a rather conventional assumption for coverage of this material, uh, especially at this level of coverage. There are two aspects of consolidation that need to be addressed. One is the magnitude of settlement, and one is time rate of settlement. We will emphasize here in this presentation the magnitude of settlement. I will begin with some coverage that's associated with time, but it's more or less to set up the stress states associated with consolidation, and we will avoid getting into the mathematics associated with details in that regard. The consolidation process can be modeled with a spring and piston analogy, and this is sometimes called a rheological model. It's one sort of rheological model. And it involves a cylinder that would be filled with incompressible oil, a load being applied from above, a valve on the cap of that uh, cylinder, as well as a spring being present within that system. And I'd like to go through a table here indicating what is occurring at different times of coverage. And we'll look at three conceptual times here, a time zero, a time greater than zero, and some time much greater than zero, or what we can call time infinity. And I'd like to look at the status for each of these, the system response, and identify with you the pressure being carried or the load being carried by oil spring or possibly some combination there. And let's consider time zero. The load is applied to this system from above and the valve is closed. Well, what would be occurring in this system at that stage? The oil pressure will increase. Now, the valve is closed, let's recall that. And the spring, therefore, cannot deform. There is no movement occurring in this system at this stage for that instant at time equals zero. Is this load being carried by oil or spring? I'll let you think about that for a moment. It would be the oil. At some time greater than zero, the load is still applied. The valve is now cracked open a bit. What will happen in that system? Oil is going to tend to squirt out of the system, and oil pressure will, that will therefore decrease. And that allows for and causes the spring to deform. In this case, load or pressure being carried by which? Oil or spring. Here it is a combination of the two, oil and spring. How about a time infinity? The load is still applied and the valve is still open. If this is left for such a very long time, the excess oil pressure will dissipate. And what that means is it would return to ambient conditions or for our purposes, atmospheric conditions. And the spring is in fact deformed. Load being carried by oil or spring. In this case, the spring. Let's consider how this analogy relates to soil mechanics for a moment. What does this spring represent in a soil? That would be equivalent to the soil skeleton, the particulate structure of soil that can hold this. The load represents the load, say a building, something like that. What does the oil represent in this system? 
incompressible oil. That's very much like water. So that'd be like water and therefore water pressures. Oil pressure would be analogous to water pressure. And finally, what does this valve represent? That's a little bit tougher. The valve would represent the hydraulic conductivity of the soil, the ability for that soil to drain. And if it's a highly draining soil, more highly draining, uh, it would be a large flow valve. If it is, say, for instance, a CH clay, it would not have availability for much flow in that regard. I'd like to look at the time sequence here for just a moment, and we'll do so in a bit of a simplified manner. Considering time of loading being instantaneous, and this would relate to a condition, say, where a building is being moved, this does occur on occasion, or uh, a prefabricated structure being built rather rapidly, something like that. And you could certainly envision that uh, in reality, this will. Uh, with construction time occurring over some months and years will actually be an angled or set of steps rather than a single step load. But let's keep this simple uh, for this discussion and just show it as instantaneous loading. Well, what I have shown here is a graphic of total stress versus time. And we have total stress, initial total stress, and that's uh, old hat by now, you know, determine 17 feet and underground, what is the starting total stress just before any kind of load application. It exists and is a given number, that's sigma naught, standing for initial load. And when that load is applied, that extra load is applied, that would come in as a delta sigma at that location and would show up something like this. And once that load is in place, it would be a flat line associated with that uh, new stress level. Let's look at water next. And we have the I, I, first plot is shown above, which we've already discussed, and now the lower plot is pore pressure versus time. And here we have an initial pore water pressure. So again, that's conventional uh, effective stress type, you know, calculations, pore pressure calculation for a given location underground. What is the pore pressure? Well, this would be the starting pore pressure, U naught. And it's moving along, happy at this level, and all of a sudden a load occurs at this green line. And as it turns out, the increase in water pressure will be the same as that delta sigma from above. And what this implies, this has an important implication that the load associated with an instantaneous loading situation is carried by water for that instant. And it is with time that that pore pressure dissipates. And this is the process of consolidation, this exponential decay of pore water pressure that you see over here. And with time, the pore pressure will return ultimately to a ambient condition, what it used to be. You can think back to the spring piston analogy, the oil returning to atmospheric conditions. And finally, let's look at effective stress. And effective stress would have some starting value, similar to those above. And this with time, it is moving along just fine at some given value. And this curve, the lowest curve on this graphic, represents total stress minus pore pressure. So it would represent the top curve minus the bottom curve. And what this indicates is that effective stress starts at some level when the load is placed, the effective stress does not change at that moment. And that means intergranular particle stress does not change at that moment. It is only with time that that takes on load and that those particles will increase in their intergranular or effective stress level. Ultimately, it will reach a value that is consistent with delta sigma. So you see this delta sigma showing up in each of these three plots.
And in this magnitude of settlement presentation, we will not deal with the rates and mathematics associated with uh, this dissipation of pore pressure, except for at time zero. Conceptually, a little bit later, just you know that it is in fact a dissipating system, and out at time infinity. And why I'm showing this is for the stress states that you recognize that it takes some time for that effective stress to be increased in the soil mass. In order to determine consolidation properties on soil, a consolidation test is conducted in the laboratory. This is a one-dimensional test and involves loading of soil, and that is presented over here with a load P. A dial gauge or LVDT is a, can be used to establish the uh, response of that system. There's a cap that would hold that load. There's a porous stone on top and bottom that holds the soil in place. There would typically be a brass cylinder, non-corroding. That's the reason brass is used. And the soil sample, a uh, similar aspect ratio as say a hockey puck would be the specimen here. And it's commonly two and a half inches in diameter. That's a rather common size for this. And what occurs here is this entire system is maintained under saturated conditions and it is loaded through a sequence of loads. And we'll see that response in time. This is the sequence of loading. So we have a displacement versus time. And you see this is what's called a step stress consolidation test. And what's occurring here is that the stress level is doubling at each increment. And this is very, very common. And each increment is left in place for 24 hours. And that is sufficient time for that small specimen to be draining that excess pore water pressure that we just discussed in the previous slides. So you would start at some value, of what would be called a seeding load, just make sure that everything's in contact and so on maybe 12 and a half kPa or 12 kPa, and then double that out to 25, 50, 100, 200, 400, and then back off on that load sum to, again, having the loads this time where you would have this. And something to note here is that when that specimen is unloaded, it does not return to where it was. And that just identifies the, that soil does not behave elastically. If you plot out the void ratio, or it can be done on a strain basis as well, but I'll show it here as void ratio. If you show void ratio versus stress, and it's always effective stress when we're talking about consolidation, so all the plots and calculations that we'll be dealing with are largely effective stress. And the stress is shown as a log scale on this plot. And each data point from the previous plot, from the step stress consolidation test, you would have a starting void ratio for the experiment. And at each of these steps, you would have a new equilibrium void ratio associated with that new stress level. And on this graphic, each data point represents one load step in that pass plot. And the green is a curve of loading. The red would be a curve of unloading. And you'll note that there are some different slopes that are prominent on this plot. We'll get around to of the meaning of those and the slopes and so on. But most certainly there is a break point here on this curve, a knee of the curve, where all of a sudden the response gets much steeper after this. And this is associated with something called the pre-consolidation stress, which we'll define in just a moment. Uh, sometimes it's called the yield stress. I don't 
particularly like that term, but if you tilt your head to the right, you will note that this looks a bit like a steel yielding curve in which it's going up on strain and all of a sudden bounces out to much higher stress levels. This is a little bit complicated because this is a log scale of stress down here. Uh, but in any event, the general uh, steepening of the curve most certainly does apply in this case. That knee of the curve is called the preconsolidation stress, sigma prime C. And this represents the highest effective stress the soil has experienced in history, and that means in geologic time. So even if it's back to a glacier that was over the city of Seattle 10,000 years ago, that would be the uh, remembered by the soil. And the soil actually retains this memory. It's an interesting aspect. Uh, the particle context and so on retain this memory of stress history and the associated structure at that stress level. If the current effective stress is less than this preconsolidation stress, incidentally, preconsolidation stress, I've shown it here and will continue to do this through the presentation as sigma prime C, rather common terminology for this. It's also commonly uh, noted as sigma prime T. So I would say those two are absolutely interchangeable and synonymous in terms of terminology. If the current sigma prime is less than preconsolidation stress, the soil is termed overconsolidated. I'll use shorthand OC for that. If the current sigma prime is approximately equal to sigma prime C, the soil is termed normally consolidated and typically within about uh, 5% of that value would be sufficient to uh, call it normally consolidated. And I will not get into the situation where sigma prime exceeds sigma prime C. Uh, there, that is discussed in some places, but for our purposes, I will just say that the knee of the curve is simply redefined at that stage because it is the highest stress the soil has experienced in history, including this moment. So if it goes beyond the knee, it is the new knee by definition. So this is what it looks like. We have sigma prime C being the knee of the curve nominally, and normally consolidated would be to the right of that, over consolidated would be to the left of that. And this is on an E log sigma prime plot a plot which we'll see several more of during this presentation. The overconsolidation ratio, OCR, is the ratio of sigma prime C to initial effective stress. And it's more or less an identification of how far back on this shallow slope line are you. Uh, are you right at the knee, in which you would have a value of one for OCR, or are you somewhere back here a little bit further in which you would have incrementally larger numbers? And in general, an OCR of eight would be considered a highly overconsolidated soil for perspective. The slopes of the lines are called a recompression index, C sub R, sometimes known as a swell index, C sub S, those two being synonymous, and a compression index, C sub C. And this again is an E log sigma plot. The slopes on a semi-log domain represent the change in void ratio, in other words, the rise for a given log cycle of run. So this would be going from 100 to 1,000 kPa or from 1,000 to 10,000, or from two to 20. Anywhere that you can find one log cycle, you'd be fine. If you just pick two random points, you can handle that mathematically, but you would involve a log component. 
in calculating that slope, but the meaning of it, the underlying meaning is the change for one log cycle for each of these. And they are known as the recompression index and the compression index, C sub R and C sub C. This plot demonstrates the process that you go through using a Casa Grande technique for identifying specifically where the knee of the curve is. And this is a refined version. Uh, and if needed in the class, I will discuss more during a lecture period. Uh, for our purposes uh, during this presentation, we can simply take sigma prime c as being the knee of the curve. But there are graphical techniques to, I'll say, dial that in a bit. Settlement is a strain base calculation. And overall settlement, capital S, is strain times layer thickness. And this is analogous to strain being delta L over L naught for a bar being stretched. And I'm showing it here, L naught, delta L being the amount that it is stretched, and that delta L being calculated as strain times the original length. So we're trying to do that sort of calculation with soils. And for soil, we have a phase diagram. And I'll show this phase diagram as conveniently selected or strategically selected with a volume of solids of one. And if that is the case, what will be the volume of voids? I'll let you think about that for a moment. It will be void ratio, or in our case, since void ratio is going to change with settlement, what we call E naught, a starting void ratio. Okay. And with that starting void ratio, we're able to identify the base phase relation for this. As a load is applied to this, what is going to happen to this system? How will that structure change? It will certainly compress. We can intuitively deal with that, but what portions of this diagram and how are they going to change? As it turns out, it's only the voids that will change and that will be a delta E. And with that delta E, we now have an opportunity to calculate strain in this soil. And that strain is shown here at the bottom, delta E over starting length. Very important that you consider the entire length of the soil, one plus E naught. So this is a term that you're gonna see showing up in settlement type calculations. And I wanted you to have some understanding of where that is coming from using just a very fundamental uh, phase diagram approach. What we're trying to do with this, when we evaluate strain of a soil, is to obtain delta E from a consolidation curve. And I have two points of interest on this curve identified with red dots. Let's call it a starting point of stress and an ending point of stress. And that delta sigma is associated here due to placement of an embankment or placement of a building, something like that, that's causing some delta sigma in a compressible soil layer. And we would have a starting effective stress. We would have a final effective stress. And all we're trying to do is evaluate what's the rise for a known run. That's all in straight, you know, middle school algebra terms. We're trying to get rise for known run. The complications here are that the uh, trend that we're evaluating is bilinear and it's a semi log plot. But aside from that, it is rise for a known run. We need to compare a starting stress, the initial effective stress, the change in stress 
to the application and including the removal of load. The final effect of stress, sigma naught prime plus delta sigma, and that occurs at time infinity, as you recall, after at least several years, typically in field applications, and the pre-consolidation stress. And you'll see that there are three possible cases, and I'd like to look at those. One is the case of a normally consolidated soil. And this means that your starting stress is the pre-consolidation stress. So normally consolidated soil means that, that it is starting right here. And you're adding a load, so you're moving forward on this plot or moving to the right on this plot. And you would follow this blue line, again, E log sigma prime curve. And we are looking to establish the rise for a given run in this case and then convert that out to the settlement for soil and what do we have here is the settlement is c sub c that's the slope of this line times h the entire layer thickness of the clay or fine grain soil undergoing consolidation. One plus E naught, that comes from that phase diagram, conversion over to a strain, times the log of a fraction. And we're gonna see this formatted equation show up in calculations of consolidation settlement. And this fraction always means ending stress over starting stress. That is what belongs in these fractions. Ending stress over starting stress. Ending stress over starting stress. Case two, this would be an over-consolidated condition. So your starting stress is to the left of the knee of the curve. And this case two will be a situation where the final stress or sigma prime naught plus delta sigma is also less than pre-consolidation stress. In other words, you're residing on the shallow slope or C sub R slope of this curve entirely. The equation therefore for settlement is very similar to what we saw above or on the previous slide, except we have a C sub R for our slope instead of C sub C. Third case, we would start with an over-consolidated soil, meaning to the left of the knee of the curve, and we will end with a stress that is to the right of the knee of the curve. And all this involves is two terms of the equation that effectively glue the components together of the red portion of the curve and the blue portion of the curve. And something to note here is that those fractions after the log are indeed endpoint over starting point. In this case, the knee of the curve is acting as the end for the red line. In this case, the knee of the curve, preconsolidation stress, is the beginning of that line. And you add those two terms together to get a total settlement. I'd like to go through an example calculation in this regard to show how this plays out with numbers and stresses and so on in this regard. And if we look at a hypothetical situation where ground surface is identified here with this hatched mark, the green embankment that's going to be placed uh, is hypothetical. That's why I'm showing it with dashed slopes. And that is not in place at time zero. So this is a proposed large embankment. And the large embankment, that means large aerial extend, that keeps things very simple from a stress distribution standpoint in terms of what 
uh, is identified uh, by the stress change. And we'll get to that in just a minute. The sand layer has a water table residing within it. So there's three feet of moist sand underlain by two feet of saturated sand, each have a unit weight associated with them, and a clay layer that's 18 feet in thickness that has the properties here, gamma sap, C sub R, C sub C, preconsolidation stress, and a starting void ratio, E naught. And the embankment will be 25 feet tall at a compacted unit weight, moist unit weight of 121. PCF. I'd like to first tackle the calculation for initial effective stress, sigma naught prime, and this will be three times 115 plus two times 119 minus 62.4, that relates to gamma prime, plus nine times 108 minus 62.4. And those subtraction of 62.4 allows us to get to a gamma buoyant or gamma prime directly and do this in one step. Uh, al alternately and equivalent mathematically, you could obtain total stress, you could obtain pore pressure and take the difference and you'd arrive at the same number. Very important aspect here, we are calculating the stress condition at the mid height of the clay layer. And we come out here with 869 PSF nominally. I've shown it exact, so you have paper trail in this regard. I'm gonna back up to that prior slide and show the importance of this mid-height location for stress. If you were to get it at the top, you'd be under representing stress conditions towards the bottom. If you grabbed it at the bottom, you'd be misrepresenting stresses at the top. So it is typical to get it at the mid-height of the layer. It is most certainly possible to subdivide a layer of compressible soil into multiple layers, and this becomes increasingly important, uh, A, when detailed data is available from multiple consolidation specimens with depth, for instance, and probably more importantly, when dealing with a situation of a smaller load and the actual delta sigma is changing with depth due to stress distribution in the soil. But in the case of one-dimensional type loading, large embankment or possibly changes in water table, this is just a delta sigma. Simple calculation applies the same everywhere and is independent of location. Next up, what's the change in stress? That would be placement of this embankment, 25 feet tall, times 121. This is acting like ah, just a new soil layer sitting on top. It's, it's so large, you know, consider quarter mile by a quarter mile embankment uh, underneath the middle of that. As far as the soil is concerned, that is a new soil layer that is being placed above it. And we have 30, 25 PSF for that case. So the final effective stress would be initial stress plus delta sigma, and we end up with 38.94. So which case is this? We have 869 to begin, 2600 pre-consolidation stress given in the problem. That's a soil property, as are the slopes on this curve that's commonly given material in a problem. And 38.94 is the final stress. So what of those three cases, which of those three are we looking at? This is over-consolidated, meaning the starting stress is less than pre-consolidation stress, and we have the condition where the final stress, or sigma naught prime plus delta sigma, is greater than pre-consolidation stress. So we're in one of these conditions where we're straddling the pre-consolidation stress, and a calculation, therefore, of settlement will involve both slopes, C sub R and C sub C. And it would look something like this. We have a red portion of the line in which I'm showing the equation down here, highlighted in red for that component, and the blue portion of the curve 
highlighted accordingly there and we can fill this in with some numbers but just uh, again a reminder about the similarity of terms or uh, being synonymous c sub r and c sub s the settlement calculation is therefore filled in looking like this using the parameters that were given in the problem these fractions after the log are endpoint over start point endpoint over start point in both cases, we end up with 0.07 plus 0.39 or 0.46 feet. Let's convert that out to inches, and that is five and a half inches. I hope this helps with your understanding of magnitude of consolidation settlement. Time rate aspects would be covered in a different module as appropriate for course load. Thank you.